What up? T-Bob here. And Jake as well. And look at you. You done stumbled upon little OTB Saints, where we bring you all the latest black and gold coverage. Who are the Saints going to draft? Who's going to be their quarterback? What does the salary cap look like? All that information and more. Hope you enjoy it. Like, subscribe. Let's talk to the man who talks Saints every day. It does an excellent job at it. Ross Jackson, host of the Locked on Saints podcast. Also, one of the wider editors of all of Locked on uh, at Ross Jackson Nola on X. Ross, what's up, brother? What's going on, man? <laughs> Doing great, man. Doing great. I, I don't think I'll ever get used to the X change. No, uh, but everybody, uh, on, good, everybody good. chuckles every time. Um, it's impossible not to. <laughs> I'll probably get sick of it eventually, but for now, it's still funny. Uh, <laughs> Ross, give us, were you, were you at practice yesterday? Yes, I was. Give us your day one biggest takeaways. Saints are Super Bowl champions. No, yeah, let's go, no, but I do think, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but I do think that this New Orleans Saints team looks awful familiar. And I don't think that that is by coincidence. And when I mean awful familiar, I don't necessarily mean 2022. I don't necessarily mean 2021, but I, I mean that this is a New Orleans Saints offense that's working to get back to it's glory days and trying to get there. We watched Derek Carr, uh, you know, get in and out of the huddle quickly, cleanly, command the offense. We saw him distribute passes all over the place, tight ends to wide receivers to running backs. We saw them uh, with a big uh, catch and run by Michael Thomas, a big screen pass to Alvin Kamara. So just things in this offense that are kind of coming back. They spent an entire period working on play action, for instance, and things like that. So you can see some of the sort of core tenets of this New Orleans Saints offense of old coming back into this New Orleans Saints offense of new. That was my biggest takeaway from day one. Hey, Ross, I want to ask you about the moves they made over the last couple of days because speaking mm-hmm. of looking familiar, I mean, they've got a familiar oh. face in <laughs> Jimmy Graham out there. They signed Trey Turner, who's been to multiple Pro Bowls, probably on the other side of his career, but still, you know, was a starter in Washington last year. Like, you often don't see signings like that this late into it right before – you start training camp. What did you think, and maybe what was the thought process in bringing those two veteran players in? Yeah, I mean, I think a big part of it is that they are veteran players, and we're we're watching this more and more. It's where players that are coming in that have you know several years of NFL experience are waiting until after mini camps, after OTAs, to sign their contracts. This is a little bit of a change in the usual course. We're used to kind of all the signings happening in March, April, May, you know, and then now we're starting to get some more of these June, July signings that end up actually kind of meaning something. And we've seen that from the Saints for the past couple of years, as well as, of course, the reunions with former LSU Tigers, former New Orleans Saints, things like that. So you got a little bit of a blend of all of that with the signing of Jimmy Graham and the signing of Trey Turner. So what the Saints do is that they're able to bring in a guy like Jimmy Graham, who's familiar with their system, that knows what it is that they want to do. According to Dennis Allen and Mickey Loomis, they made it kind of sound like Jimmy Graham was saying it's either the New Orleans Saints or nobody, kind of Drew Brees-ish in that way. Uh, but the Saints were able to bring him back, and now they add another veteran to that room, which is otherwise, with the exception of Foster Moreau, who by all intents and purposes is still young, is a young room. Uh, and then you look at the offensive line, similar you know, similar situation in terms of depth. You've got James Hurst, but then outside of James Hurst, you have a lot of young guys for depth. Uh, you know, the Lewis kids and uh, uh, Landon Young and Calvin Throckmorton, uh, so on and so forth. So now you get another veteran guy that comes in. They also brought in Max Garcia as well, who they, they really like as a center. That's a spot where they needed to fill. So they, they're really looking at opportunities to be able to add NFL experience, NFL reps, veteran experience into some of their core depth spots. I think there are a couple of those left, like defensive line and linebacker, that I wouldn't be surprised to see them continue to add to over the course of camp. Yeah, backup linebacker is certainly a concern, something that Jake was talking about the other day. Um, I want to go a little in the weeds here, and this mm-hmm. is a question that I don't know that even many – is going to excite too many Saints fans, but you mentioned James Hurst, and it's kind of interesting. You look up and you realize, wait, James Hurst has played in 33 games the last years and started 31 of them, and then yesterday you get out there, and while while Caesar Reese and Trevor Penning were limited when they were they, they they were the first up to go right during team drills, and it wasn't Pete at left guard, it was Hurst. And then when Penny came off the field, Hurst kicked out, Pete comes in. Are, are, did, am, am I reading too much into this, or is this telling me that James Hurst is actually going into camp uh, being viewed as a starting left guard? I think that James Hurst is going into camp view, being viewed as a starting offensive lineman for certain, as okay. in somebody that obviously has that experience, right? But I do think that maybe yesterday's 
you know, James Hurst getting that first snap was more indicative of the ramp up and the rhythm of how they wanted to go through. Because Trevor Penning took a couple of snaps, then he went off, and then when he went off, James Hurst bounced to the outside, and his feet came in, and then now Calvin Brockmorton went in for season release. He's released went off for a little while, then we saw Andrews Pete move, and then, uh, you know, James Hurst moved to another position. And so we just kind of watched them shuffle around a bunch. I wouldn't read too much into it yet, but certainly as this week goes along and you start to see more Trevor Penning reps, more Andrews Pete reps, more Cesar Ruiz reps, if you start to see James Hurst jumping Andrews Pete, then that's something to watch. I, I do think that Andrews Pete is not – I, I think that he's not a guy that you can pencil in or, or, or rather that you can only pencil in as a starter at left guard. I think there's enough competition here, and there's enough kind of with the readjustment of his contract and the way that the, the Saints did view and about that this offseason that you don't have to be married to Andrews Pete at left guard as your starter any longer if you don't want to, and he would be really quality depth. So if you feel like James Hurst is the right spot and if he outperforms, I think the New Orleans Saints could listen to what they're seeing there. Ross, where are you at 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 linebacker right now? Because I feel like it's a position we've started to talk about over the last couple of days because you obviously have stars, Demario Davis, Pete Warner, that you feel really, really good about. But Pete Warner has yet to play a full season, certainly missed games the last two years. And Demario Davis obviously is getting a little bit older. So what's the depth look like at that position? Because you've got a lot of unproven guys behind those two really good starters. Yeah, it's, it's a really, really young position behind those two, that's for sure. And, and I think that what, the way that I tend to look at the immediate depth, uh, in addition to DeMario Davis and Pete Werner, is that I start with kind of this 3A, 3B conversation. Because there's the third linebacker that's on the field with those guys, but then there's also that other linebacker that has to come in in place of those guys yeah. if something were to happen. If they, let's just say they needed to tie a shoe or they needed to get their helmet you know, put back on. And so who's the guy that steps into the coverage role versus who's the guy that's a strong side on ball linebacker over the opposite side, or, or in addition to those two guys within a three linebacker set mm-hmm. or a base set. And I think the answer to those two questions are two different names. I think that Zach Bond right now is the guy as the strong side linebacker, maybe a little bit more of a, I, I think that with the things learned with Cade Nellis and the supplementary pass rush from the second level and how they can get that done with a third linebacker on the field, or sometimes with just one of your two linebackers, I think, their understanding of how Caden Ellis was able to do that is going to help Zach Bond. And Pete Werner highlighted that Zach Bond has come into this camp with the most confidence that he's ever had. So maybe that's because okay. he's seeing a more similar role to what made him draftable in college as an on-ball guy that was a pass rusher, that was a run stop for all of these other things. So that could be tied together. So I look at him as the strong side guy. The 3B who comes in in place of the coverage linebacker in terms of backup role for me right now is DeMarco Jackson, the App State linebacker that they drafted last year. We didn't get to see him last year because he had the preseason injury that ended the season before it could begin. But he's doing a lot of green dot work with him, you know, making, you know, with green dot is just the small green dot on the helmet that designates this is the helmet with a communications headset in it so that he can call the shots, okay. communicate with folks, things like that. And so he's kind of been working in that Mike linebacker role with that. But outside of those guys, you're waiting to see who's going to step up. Andrew Dowell, the special teams ace, had a great play yesterday where he punched the ball out of Juwan Johnson's hand, recovered it, and probably would have had a pretty good return off of it. So big plays like that are going to be the ones to watch out for. But, of course, consistency is, is, is king when it comes to training camp. Uh, Ross buried the lead here. Had her boy Mikey T look. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's any coincidence that the very first pass of team drills was Derek Carr uh, trying to get a pass into Michael Thomas. Now, Paul Smith-Devo made a great play on that ball and knocked it away, but it didn't take long for Derek Carr and Michael Thomas to connect again on a, on a, 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 on a, a later slant route. And then they also connected on a route, I believe it was crossing from one side of the field to the other, but they connected over on the left side uh, of the field. And then everything that Derek Carr kind of illustrated about what makes Michael Thomas special over the course of the offseason one of the things that he highlighted was his ability to catch and immediately get upfield, get north and south immediately, and that allows him to turn an eight-yard gain into a 13-yard gain, which is the difference of extending your drive. Mm-hmm. And we saw him do exactly that. Now, it went for far more than 13 yards. It was a pretty big pickup, but it did kind of come as a, a big moment for everyone to see Michael Thomas still be able to do that and have the confidence in his body to do it. This is a guy that's dealing with, you know, that has dealt over the course of the past three years with injuries to both of his feet in different capacities. So you can understand maybe if there's a little bit of 
conservatism to his ability to stick his foot in the ground and get upfield. None of that was there. There was no hesitation, no discomfort at all. He caught that pass, immediately turned upfield, picked up big yards. That's what you want to see from Michael Thomas, and I'm looking forward to continuing to see more of that throughout camp. Hell yeah. yes, dude. Right. Got one more before we let Ross go. Uh, initial thoughts yeah, on right. Brian Brzee, Ross, because yeah. it's a guy that obviously was selected in the first round, a guy that a lot of people thought would be the Saints selection in the first round, even before the draft you know, started there in May. I know it's a defensive tackle position, but this is somebody the Saints wanted. They get their guy. How did he look in day one? Yeah, so uh, what I'll say is that he's really violent. I mean, he's incredibly violent. He's really strong. Like um, and, and he's a guy that's got really, really good burst off the line of scrimmage. All that stuff, you know, we knew from his college tape, but it, it, it translates out here on the field. And that, that's a collection of not only yesterday, but also what we've seen from him in many camps and OTAs. Because I'll be honest, it, it, it's a little tough to gauge the defensive line, the offensive line, the first couple of days of camp before these guys get pads on, right? So what you're really looking for throughout these first couple of days of camp is, does anybody look lost? Does anything look glaringly incorrect? None of that was there for Brian Brzee. And in the next piece that you're looking for is, are they getting, you know, are the defensive linemen getting in position to make plays? And you saw a, a couple of examples of that. Guys like Jerron Cage, Kate Turner had a couple of those moments. Kenneth Passigno was, you know, continuously popping off the field. But I will say that Brian Brzee found his way in run fits and things like that, which is kind of the biggest hurdle for him coming into uh, the NFL. We know he can rush the passer. We know he could be an interior penetrator, but what can he do as a run defender? So you saw him in good position and taking communication, taking notes, coaching, all of that coming really fluidly for him. So those are all good steps forward, but it's really going to be in a couple of days when the pads come on that we'll really get an opportunity to say, hey, here's who Brian Pazzi is as a New Orleans thing. I look forward to hearing more about his interior penetration, and that's the best coverage you're going to get. I knew as soon as he said it. Ross Jackson, at (laughs) Ross Jackson Nola. Wow, just amazing black and gold takes right there, Jake. I don't think I've ever heard any takes that are better than the two guys that just gave you that take. And you can keep getting them by going ahead and liking, subscribing, ringing the bell to get notifications when we post. Have a great day. We'll see you on the next OTB Saints.